Thank, thank you all for coming and joining us tonight. Look, this is a, a big debate for New Zealand, the climate, cha the climate change and the policy settings around. We've done a bunch of meetings around recently around wool sheds, and it's been really good because what we've, uh, what we've highlighted is let's go back to the science and make sure that the science informs the positions that the government are taking and effectively whatever policy falls out of that. I don't come up with the science. We engage with some pretty intelligent guys. I feel kind of important speaking at a lectern here, but it's actually David who spends his life speaking at a lectern because it's Professor David Frame from Canterbury University. Now, David's done time in New Zealand Treasury over the years. He's spent time up in Oxford University. David and Miles Allen are your biggest advocates for the appropriate metric to inform methane, which is a, the, mo the most significant gas for our agricultural sector. So look, there'll be a bit of contention around here and we expect that and that's why we truck David down here because we all have an opinion on this stuff and it goes right from bookend of one end, we shouldn't be doing anything, the science doesn't support us doing anything, right through to the government's chuck is going to chuck us an ETS. And those are the two bookends of the conversation and it really is about as simple as that. And then we've got to find our place in the middle that is supported by science and then can construct a policy that works for our sector that doesn't put us in here and links our short-lived gas as one short-lived gas and one long-lived gas on our farm to an existential carbon price that sits over here linked to ETS. So look, I just wanted to say this is really important. You know, MPI did a report recently, $52 billion generated from you guys, our sector. 82% of New Zealand's export revenue generated from you guys. So we've got to get this right in the policy settings because there's no way we can compromise that. By the same token, we've been having this conversation for 19, 20 years, 2003 fart tax, and we thought we got out of jail free then, but what you guys probably don't realise, we actually committed to a levy research fund from 2003 through to now, and that's what's delivered your low methane genetic sheep, your um, inhibitor work we're doing, the vaccines and all the stuff we've done around feeds. So this debate is not going away. This is not a Labor government debate. This is a successive National Party signed us up to the Kyoto Protocol, uh, sorry, the Paris Accord in 2008, and National government put those 30% <coughs> NDCs in place. And National government are on record saying we will price your emissions. So if your strategy is to tell the government, current government to piss off and wait till we get in government and think you're going to get away with it, well, that's not really that good a strategy, is what national government has openly said to us. What national party has also said is that we support the uh, what the sector has put up with the Tewaka Ekinawa proposal. So I want to go all the way back to the base science with David. There's a lot of people in the room be interested. So because so many people here, can I limit each question to one? David does this with his students. Bruce, I see you laughing already, mate. <coughs> Can we do this? And we talk about tradable question rights, as we're talking about tradable methane rights or whatever. If you want to dominate with your questions or your statements, you have to trade them off with somebody else, because we've only got so much time here tonight. David's going to put this into three sections. We're going to talk about base science, and then we're going to talk about the three different gases being stocks and flows, and what would be the appropriate metric to set any policy around. And then finally, we're going to go into the policy stuff. So David will take questions at the end of each se section, and then we'll have a session at the end where David and I can both be here. So, look, thanks for coming. This is really tough stuff. This is big policy setting that affects us all. So thanks, David, for coming and doing it. Thanks. Great. OK, thanks, Andrew. Um, so, uh, where are we? First of all, um, well, one thing, I, it's nice to be back in Invercargill. I grew up down here. I grew up in Otatara. I went to South Otatara Primary and... Southland Boys, and then went to Canterbury where I studied physics and philosophy, <clears throat> did my PhD there in atmospheric physics, <clears throat> went to the Treasury for a couple of years, and Andrew said I did time in Treasury and did feel a wee bit that way, and then went uh, off to the University of Reading, I did postdoc there and then worked at the University of Oxford for 10 years in a number of roles. While there I wrote with Miles Allen on the point that um, the, the phrase net zero comes from our work where we showed that there was a connection <clears throat> linear connection between um, cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide and warming. Um, but right from the start, we were troubled that this didn't work for short-lived gases, that cumulative framework. And I'll explain that partly as we go. So we, we wrote that paper in 2009. Um, that work was influential on the subsequent IPCC report. In the mid-2010s, um, 
in the middle years of the last decade, um, we came up with an alternative for a, a t approaching how we quantify methane, GWP star, and I'll talk about that a little more as when we get there. First of all, whoops. <clears throat> First of all, Andrew suggested I, I do this. I think it's a useful framing slide. Um, the ultimate thing we're here to talk about is agricultural climate policy, I think. Um, just to get the dynamics right, uh, 11, 11 bodies, 11 different um, uh, groups came together and they worked on a joint proposal uh, involving trade-offs from all of them, and you may not like where those trade-offs landed, but 11 different groups came together and put forward a joint proposal to the government. The government then accepted some elements of it but rejected other elements of it. I uh, don't think it's fair to hold that 11 body organise the, the people behind Haywaka for what the government said they would like and not like, right? That was a, was a two stage process. If, if my son, you know, draws, writes something or does, provides some information for my daughter and I tear it in pieces and then give it to my daughter, she's got no right to blame him for it, right? It's, that's on me. She would blame him because she's a little sister, but, but that, it's not actually fair. So you've got to catch, capture the dynamics properly there. On Haywaka, where I'm going to land, is that I think there are some good things to fight about, and I hope you all made submissions like I did. Yep. So mine said I would more than halve the price. Nearly all... Uh, I won't jump here. I would say that. Uh, sequestration, I think that on-farm sequestration should count. Um, the 20, 30 and 2050 targets need revising. Um, there needs to be a review process around international benchmarking uh, domestic behavioural response. So that you, you put your price in, you see a behavioural response. You want quite quickly to learn from that whether you're overshooting or undershooting your target. You certainly don't want massive rural poverty developing out of your policy, right? So that, that review phase needs to be taken seriously. Cap and trade versus levy is the sort of thing that we could spend two hours on arguing about anyway. It's complicated. Things not to fight about, well, that one's complicated. I'd like to park that at least until the final section. Uh, basic idea that you're paying for the warming you continue to cause I don't think is worth fighting about. The two-basket approach in principle is a good idea and I think it's a mistake to, to go into the ETS. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain all that towards the end. First of all, why do we think there's a problem? This is just a little bit of basic, um, fairly basic physics. For any planet, planet in equilibrium, energy in equals energy out. And what you see is the distance from the sun more or less determines most of your, your warmth. There are some exceptions. Um, that's some minor exceptions to that line, but basically planets are heated by the sun uh, and the black body approximation, the standard approximation that falls out of quantum mechanics is, is, um, works pretty well for, for pretty much all planets. Here on Earth, the energy budget looks a bit like this. This was from the fifth assessment report of the IPCC. On average, you get 340 watts per square metre of sunlight coming down at the top of the atmosphere about 161 watts per square metre make it all the way down to the Earth. Some is reflected from clouds. You know this, you've seen satellite photos in the visible, you know, visible wavelengths, you've seen satellite photos of Earth, and you notice just how bright those cloud tops are. Um, now, the rest, this 160 watts is absorbed and then re-radiated, uh, or, or the energy makes its way from Earth. 397 watts per square metre um, are re-radiated, only a small fraction of that makes it straight out. Most of it is trapped by the atmosphere, re-radiated in all directions, including back down to the surface. And that's what makes the world warmer. Now, this... Uh, oh, and then there are also some other secondary processes like evaporation. So if you shine sunlight onto, onto you know, um, as you know from Invercargill quite well, puddles, then the water eventually evaporates, and that's an energetic process, the energy in water vapour coming out of the, into the atmosphere is the result of that. The other one is um, sensible heat, which is actually the thermal contact between the earth and the and winds. So that's a, um, that's a, it's not hugely important for the, for the radiation points we're going to make. But, um, so the earth is much more, it, tr it transmits much more on the short waves inwards than it does uh, let straight out from the earth. So it's, so the atmosphere is more opaque at longer wavelengths, at the wavelengths where the Earth is radiating back out to space. Um, and the, the sun spectrum looks a bit like this. This is wavelength uh, in the logarithmic scale, and then this is the intensity here. So sunlight peaks. The sun's average temperature is around 6,000 
Kelvin, or it's a black body approximation, about 6,000 Kelvin, the outer layers of the sun. And the Earth's uh, temperature is roughly 288 Kelvin. So this shines on that, and then, and then this 288 arises from that, that uh, budget that is um, closing that budget. So the Earth radiating, the surface of the Earth radiating to the atmosphere, being really radiated in all directions, and then gradually, um, over time, a given fraction will radiate out such that temperatures rise, and then you end up with this stable situation. So the Earth is, you know, the fundamental driver of Earth's climate in that sense is temperature. The reason it's not absolute zero is because the sun, the anthropogenic perturbation, that's 288 Kelvin, Kelvin to Celsius, 270, 273 uh, Kelvin is freezing point of water, so that's uh, about 15 degrees Celsius is the average temperature of the Earth. It's gone up by about a degree because of human activities emitting CO2 to the atmosphere, okay? But this is an enhancement of a naturally occurring greenhouse effect. Um, this is just a slide expanding a little bit on that. Um, so this is it, the, the black body approximation at the top of the atmosphere uh, is in the dashed line. Uh, observations from satellites uh, are, um, suggest that the, 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 ra the radiation curve should be up here like this. It's attenuated slightly by, um, oops, by uh, ozone, which you knew about, because you know that, that's, that, that if that radiation, that short wavelength radiation gets down to Earth, it, it changes things quite a lot, um, and it, would, it does damage to cells, as New Zealanders don't need to be told. Um, uh, and then at the surface of the Earth, uh, you, have the, um, you have this curve, and there are, again, there are absorption lines here, corresponding to molecules. The, what happens is that the molecules uh, absorb, um, they only absorb certain frequencies of radiation because they, because they have fairly discrete uh, energy bands that they're jumping between. This is all just, just part of quantum mechanics. And you see the same in spectra on other satellites uh, and other planets as well. Actual line behavior is, is complicated uh, by overlaps between lines, dependence on atmospheric conditions. So the difference between um, mid-latitude, mid-winter, and tropical temperatures can be quite significant, for instance. So you're kind of having to go right around the Earth and look at all the different bits, whether it's cloudy, whether it's clear, uh, what time of year it is, what latitude, and so on. So you need to put all this together. But the basic, the basic idea is that you have a line, an absorption line in the spectrum that's preventing the Earth from getting that radiation back out to space and cooling, and you're thickening it when you add concentrations of greenhouse gases. And the, the, you know, there, there are, there are, the two main greenhouse gases are water vapour and CO2. Both occur naturally, as methane occurs naturally, nitrous oxide also occurs naturally. The big thing is that we've enhanced the CO2 in the atmosphere, the concentrations from 280 parts per million in the pre-industrial period to about 400 parts per million today. I think we went past 400 last, last year. There's a little seasonal cycle on it um, as the mainly to do with the asymmetry and where um, the land is, actually. Um, so you're kind of trying to quantify the effect of slight changes in line shift. For, for carbon dioxide, that's uh, logarithmic. So if you um, in double the CO2, you increase the, um, the uh, radiative forcing, as we call it, the, the effectiveness on the, on the Earth's energy budget of, that, of, um, of CO2. If you double it again, you get you don't get the same amount that it, that um, effect saturates to some extent. It's logarithmic in CO2 for nitrous oxide and methane. It goes as a square root. This is all pretty standard radiation physics. Um, it may seem that trace elements can't really. How could something? So we talk about 400 parts per million. This is an old textbook saying 386 parts per million. Uh, doesn't seem like very much. Um, in terms of fraction, it's a lot like the fraction. That, this is blood alcohol content expressed as a fraction, and you're all familiar that that particular trace uh, species can do can alter things quite substantially. Um, at five at point zero five percent, that's where a lot of legal limits are on alcohol. Um, we're about we're at point zero four because that's what four parts per, four hundred parts per million means. Um, with four hundred parts per million, you actually have there are ten to the forty four molecules, 10 to the power of 44 molecules in the atmosphere. You can kind of work that out by knowing the surface pressure and the whole, you know, how heavy everything is. And then um, if you take 400 parts per million or 0.04%, 
that's 10 to the 40. So there are 10 to the power of 40 carbon dioxide molecules in the atmosphere. Uh, that's quite a few. That's plenty to be going on with. Um, so there's plenty of these species up there to trap the radiation. In the case of CO2, uh, in the case of methane, uh, this is a plot I did on the plane, so um, it is just hacked together. But basically, you have CO2 and water, va uh, CO2 and water vapor, or CO2 and water rather, uh, for the ruminant um, grow the grass. The ruminant eats the grass, emits methane, and the methane breaks down into CO2 and H2O. Okay, that's that's the closed cycle, and then you're back with CO2 and H2O, which is what you started with. In the case of alcohol, you have um, you grow a hops or, or grapes, CO2 and H2O. Uh, you let it ferment, you keep it out of uh, oxygen, you keep it in low oxygen thing so it won't um, oxidise, and you create alcohol, and a person then transmits that back into CO2 and H2O. But again, everybody knows that alcohol is in effect while those chemicals are in the state of being alcohol. All right? So something can start from CO2 and H2O and end as CO2 and H2O, but in the meantime can have quite a substantial effect while transmitted into, well, you know, recombined into some other form. Okay? Right. That's the first bit of that, I think. Yeah, so we raced through that because a bunch of us aren't scientists, but there's some really scientific heads in there. David, you were at a, or the statement you made around New Zealand farmers understanding the Oh, science. yeah. I'll, I'll show you that slide in a bit, but I gave this uh, very, uh, that bit I actually do to non-physicists about physics, um, and I used to do in our Masters of Climate Change course. Um, some of the slides I took from the actual physics course, but um, I gave most of the rest of the talk to uh, the Pacific Climate Consortium's um, annual event. The University of Washington have a great atmospheric sciences department and oceanographic department. And I gave this talk to 80 graduate students and faculty. Um, and it was really interesting. And that this, so this material is what we talk about when we go talk to those kind of people. Um, I'll go through it slightly slower, but not much, I think. Um, because actually, I think New Zealand farmers are um, often more familiar with this than, than um, a lot of others. I have my wife, please. Yeah, so just can, can you go back one slide, yeah. please, to the alcohol one? Yeah. Go to the bottom one. Yep. I'd like to see CO2 come right on the left hand side. Right on the left oh, hand yeah, side. Oh, yep, there. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. One. I should have CO2 and H2O. Yeah. Now, if CO2 is taken out of the atmosphere yep. to grow the plant, yep. then it goes to the ruminant. Yep. Now, yep. the plant is sequestering some carbon in the soil. Yes. I'm not yep. Put a number on it. Yep. Some. So yep. we've lost some carbon, goes to the ruminant, the ruminant, and all whether it's a sheep or a cow, yep. takes out carbon for maintenance, reproduction, wool growth, 51% yep. of wool yep. is carbon. Yep. Are you getting credits for that, guys? <laughs> now, that, if yep. you look at it, in real science, that is a complete loop. Therefore, farmers running ruminants add nothing to the atmosphere. They add methane while it's in the form of methane. And that changes temperatures while it's in the form of methane. But so you're right. You're 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 right that carbon comes out down here. And I haven't talked in this talk about soil carbon. I'm not an expert in soil carbon. I would support including soil carbon in a scheme uh, as part of a warming-based approach. Um, I it's it, it's an area I haven't really looked at. Um, that I. I I don't see why you wouldn't. I, I believe in doing this on the basis of warming. And it's, it's true that not every CO2 molecule that grows this is going to end up as methane. That's absolutely correct. So we've sequestered some. We've sequestered some. Methane yep. cycle. And of course, when this animal dies, if, you, if, if, it were, if parts of it were buried, then it would, uh, that would be a sequestration as well. There are, there are lots of... I haven't got a budget on this. The basic point is... You can start with CO2 and H2O, and you can end up, you can have as an intermediate phase, and you can end with CO2 and H2O, you can end, but in an intermediate phase, you can have something that makes a perturbation to a system because of chemical recombination. That's what we have with alcohol and people. That's what we have with methane and global mean temperatures. That, that cycle through a ruminant, yep. methane, it's been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. There There's is no a... There more ruminants on the planet yeah. now than there was... So I think that is an issue that needs to be talked about more in terms of uh, in the global budget. And I know I've seen 
People in the States argue that the, that the current American cows are only replacing the bison herds that were, were taken away. I don't know the numbers on that. I have seen that debate. Um, I don't know... I don't know what the data are like, but but in a in a warming based system, I absolutely think that should count in principle. Just like if if there have been you know rice paddies that have been in existence for thousands of years or you know long long time, then that should count in a, within a coherent warming based framework. So I have no problem with that. Sorry, so why why don't think, we get that that's eight, that's three questions. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay. The point we're making yep. here was we're demonstrating, as a David, it was an illustrative demonstration yeah. how a reconstitution, like alcohol, can cause an issue as it goes through its reconstitution. Is we in the Haywaka Kanoa proposal, the ability to uh, embed soil carbon is sitting there. We've done a lot of work with Louis Shipper at Waikato University around soil carbons, and embedded carbon in wool and or in wood are the, are the other things that can be included over time. I would love it if you ended up in a situation where labelling included credit for wool on a on a garment against as against a plastic. That'd be brilliant. Ian? So the question is that you talk about two hundred and eighty parts per million of CO two and you go to four hundred parts per million of CO two as we are now. What I'd like to know, we've done mapping of history mm -hmm. and there's been parts of history that I've been told that that CO2 has been over 400 parts per million. So why yeah. is this caused by animals? Oh. Why, why isn't it a natural form that's happening within our So the climate does vary. The climate varies on a on millennia. Um, and there's a long, like the, there was a, there have been phases they think when the earth was like a snowball phase and really, really cold. And it was actually volcanoes and CO2 that got it out of that phase. And there have been phases where it's what they call a hothouse earth, where you have temperatures, the paleo Eocene, was it Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum or something like the PETM, where it's a lot warmer than today. And I think those are arguments against some of the crazy you know, tipping points perspectives that say we're all going to die if things change too radically. But the primary driver of those long term variations is orbital wobbling, where you can keep the especially ice ages, where you can keep the pole isolated for long enough, for enough of the year, to grow a large ice sheet all over North America, basically all over North America and over the north, the far north. And that then, through an albedo effect, um, lowers, lo it, it backscatters that radiation. So instead of 160 watts falling, you might only get 140. And then the Earth is dealing with a weaker radiation budget on the other side. Um, over the last 10,000 years or 20,000 years or so, or 20, 25,000 years ago I think is the last glacial maximum, but over the last 10,000 years, the Holocene, temperatures and sea levels have been very stable, roughly near that 280. It vary, it's varied a bit. Uh, things like volcanoes and other events have, um, have uh, made a difference, but, um, but uh, that isn't the reason for the spike in temperatures in the last 200 years, which is primarily CO2. So CO2 is responsible for about one degree of warming, methane for somewhere around maybe 0.3 or thereabouts uh, degrees of warming since pre-industrial times. And, and that 0.3, I would put in it personally, I would put an asterisk beside it for the reason to do with meth the number of um, the extent of wetlands and the number of ruminants in the pre-industrial period. OK? Any more questions? I just... This is being videoed too, that you guys can watch this later online if you want to. We took the opportunity with David to get a video. At this stage, I do want to say in respect to a bunch of people in the crowd, um, that there is different scientific beliefs, and let's acknowledge that, and let's continue that debate because that's the that's the nature of science. That um, we want to actually find the answer, and that will that will be a never-ending story. So I just want to acknowledge that here um, because we had a session with some guys earlier. You get a bit frustrated with this stuff and may have a different view, but let's just acknowledge the different views and let's keep that science debate going. Yeah, and um, and all I'm presenting here is sort of the mainstream climate perspective. This is this is what you read in textbooks, and this is this is where most of the climate the, the climate research community is at. Um, there will always be different perspectives because that's how science works. Richard, um, oh yep. Yeah.
Well, yeah, I don't know, to be honest. How would you count the carbon ridiculously cheap to sell rather than just I think it's because that isn't an extra kick in this process. If you have CO, uh, CO2 here, goes into room and it comes out as CO2, it, it, that really doesn't make a difference. It's, it's when it comes out as methane that it then has an additional radiative perturbation. CO2 makes a, the, the overall atmospheric burden of CO2 makes a difference. Whether or not I breathe it in and I breathe it out isn't, doesn't really change anything very much. Because I think that's what annoys us the most, is just the cycle. And we can't on it. You could say, when we breathe and... Yeah, but it's, it's, yeah, it's the fossil reservoir that, that is pulling geologically retired carbon out of, out, out of those fossil reservoirs and putting it in the atmosphere that is overwhelmingly the driver here and actually it, it frustrates me when I see people pretend that it's either deforestation or it's animal agriculture or it's rice production or it's some other thing because it's really obvious when you look at the data that it's fossil, this is about this is a fossil fuel problem Yep and you can argue, you can have good arguments about uh, why methane concentrations haven't tracked as you would expect them to from methane emissions, and, and that may well be missing sources in the, in the system that we, that we don't know enough about natural sources. That, that, is, that is an area I know there's live debate of, and people have pointed at wetlands um, is one of the potential culprits, and probably also under-reporting by fossil sources and all sorts of... There could be a bunch of things. Not all countries... It's kind of weird, like, not all... New Zealanders often need to be reminded that not all countries are quite as thorough about record-keeping in these sorts of things as we are. Um, some lack capability, you know. Some don't have civil servants in Wellington who are so attentive to these issues. Um, <laughs> OK, now I'd like to move on to uh, flow and stock pollutants. So there are some things in the world that, uh, that, that break down in an environment, and there are other things that don't. And if you have, uh, with a flow pollutant, so um, uh, caffeine, let's move to a different drug for a change, caffeine in the bloodstream. You have a cup of coffee in the morning, coffee goes up, the caffeine in your bloodstream goes up. Or methane in the atmosphere, the methane concentrations go up. You have another one, the next, another coffee the next day, you need that to replenish that elevated level of caffeine. Um, likewise, if you emit the same amount of methane you emitted yesterday, then the concentrations are going to broadly be stable over time because if you weren't emitting, then the concentrations would drop because that substance is reactive. It, that's why it decays over time. So in the case of methane in the atmosphere, it, it, it's in these, in these um, chemical reactions with the hydroxyl radical and it breaks down into CO2 and water and a couple of other short-lived products as well. Um, that is not the case with CO2 or, say, heavy metals in the soil, for instance, or um, heavy metals in your body either. You make an emission or you... Um, you know, sniff some mercury or something or ingest some lead, you permanently elevate the concentration of that substance in the relevant system. So CO2 works quite a lot like this. This is a reasonable approximation, but we will unpick that. But certainly lead in your bloodstream or in your brain or whatever will build up like this. If you expose to it, that first unit won't go away. It doesn't react. It's not, re it's not reacting in such a way that it breaks down. Uh, and the second unit just adds to the burden. And this is what we call a stock pollutant. Okay, so this is all, you know, pretty familiar. This is standard stuff that, that people dealing with hazardous, with, with various sorts of waste, have to deal with all the time, right? There are some pollutants in a river, for instance, that might break down, which are essentially flow pollutants. Um, something like biodegradable detergent out of, your, out of your sink or something like that, out of somebody's sink near a river. But there are other pollutants, and again, we could use mercury, which are going to build up in that river. And you don't normally regulate them by pretending that you can sort of swap one for the other. We could establish a system based on, say, um, lethality to exchange between cups of coffee or pints of beer on the flow side and, you know, little shots of mercury on the other, 
but I don't think you'd find a public health official anywhere in the world that would agree with it, even though Treasury might think it was efficient on economic grounds. And unfortunately, that's the world we're in with, uh, weirdly, with um, greenhouse gases. Uh, CO2 does break down over... Oh, the, if, if you elevate levels of CO2 and then you stop adding to, if you stop emitting, then the CO2 will eventually break down. So if you emit CO2 in year one, there is actually most gases you can approximate as a single timescale decay constant. Just they, like methane's decay timescale is about 10 years. Um, for CO2, there's, there's a uh, biosphere uptake, soils, plants, um, and then there's also the upper layers of the ocean, the ocean invasion, the, the phase from moving from the atmosphere into the ocean, uh, often part of wind-driven waves, mixes all that stuff together. Then there is um, mixing across uh, from the surface layers of the ocean into the deep ocean, and finally there's a very long-term storage of CO2. Uh, the, the, the way that nature creates those fossil reservoirs is through rock weathering and geological processes. But basically, the take-home point here is that of the kilogram of CO2 emitted from your car's tailpipe uh, uh, today, around about, you know, up to around 30% is still in the atmosphere a thousand years later. Um, and there are reasons I say that rather than pick the median value that have to do with the context around it and the fact that it's not just a pulse emission taken in isolation, but it's, uh, taking, pla it's taking place in the context of a change in carbon cycle, which pushes that number up a little. Right, so that's why we sort of treat it as a stock pollutant. If 30% of the stuff hangs around for a thousand years, it was longer than human beings have been on this landmass, then, then that is um, pretty permanent by human timescales. Um, and what the CO2, um, what the cumulative emissions point is, is that the area under the emissions curve, there's a small um, amount of emissions of CO2, there's a large amount of emissions of CO2, so that's where we peak emissions early and we get down to net zero or zero, and then one where we increase emissions a lot, and then we eventually come down to zero. The atmospheric concept, those are the emissions, the atmospheric concentrations look like that, m which mirrors that plot we saw the slide before, the early c come down from the biosphere and the upper layers of the ocean, the slower, um, the slower ocean processes inter with, uh, mixing within the ocean, but the geological processes aren't really, they, they are occurring, but they're not dominating on these timescales. And then the temperatures are fairly flat. Uh, and it turns out that it's the area under this curve that determines that temperature. And this is the point that we made in the 2009 paper on uh, cumulative emissions uh, being linear in warming or warming is linear and cumulative emissions, rather. Um, so, we all agree that warming is linear and cumulative emissions. Like, the, the climate science community arrived, settled on that quite fast, actually, over, over just a few years. Um, but it doesn't work for short-lived gases because they don't accumulate. So the framework isn't quite right for them. So there are these things called emissions metrics, which are trying to summarise the effects on the climate of uh, different sorts of um, emissions, um, of emissions of different gases. And in, the, in around about 1990, the, this idea was developed using a precedent and using the same personnel who had been, um, well, the people who had been thinking about the ozone destruction problem, they'd come up with an ozone destruction potential for different species, because all these CFCs, and you're wanting to figure out which ones are the really bad ones and which ones aren't quite so bad. Um, now, what they came up with with the um, climate change case was the global warming potential. Um, and this uh, kind of... what Because they weren't sure about the climate sensitivity and for a few other reasons, they ended up comparing... The, they stayed short of going from the climate forcing, which they thought they knew reasonably well, to the climate response, which they were less certain of at that, at that point. Um, so they compare the time-integrated radiative forcing of a kilogram of some species X versus a kilogram of CO2 over a 100-year timescale. So this, in the first assessment report, I should have actually included the text because it says quite clearly there's no perfect way to do this. It's actually kind of tricky. Here is a simple way that's been developed to illustrate the problems. 
it absolutely didn't say, yeah, you should use this forever and a day. But that's what, that's what got stuck in the climate, in the emerging climate change kind of regime about how people think about it. And that's what people still use today. And it's behind, that idea is behind, um, the idea behind what we call CO2 equivalents, which is where they try and, it's used in the ETS, for instance, and other areas where people say this is CO2 equivalent to that. So that's when they compare your uh, um, beef burger or something, a, a food item um, with uh, chicken or with um, legumes of some sort, they do it using this, C, this GWP100 CO2 equivalents. I'm about to show you why that doesn't work. Uh, 20, or 20 years ago, roughly, um, Keith Shine at Reading, who has worked in this field for a very long time, uh, came up with the idea of global temperature potential 100, so this is comparing, this is, instead of integrating under a curve, this is comparing at um, 100 years out how much of a difference is this kilogram of gas made versus that kilogram of gas. And for methane, this number is around about 30, 20, 28 for a long time. It's bounced up and down, 28, 30, 31, whatever. This one is about, I think, 6 or thereabouts, 4 to 6, depending on exactly what, what you've got in it. But it's much smaller. So Brazil were very keen on this. But it... X. X is some species other than CO2. So any gas other than CO2. So nitrous oxide has a GWP 100 of 290 or thereabouts. So you're comparing two separate gases. gases. Yeah, you against each other. Yes, on the. Is that a good idea? Well, they're using time integrated radiative forcing over 100 years, and I don't think that's a good idea. But let me keep going. So about five six years ago, as part of this thinking about cumulative emissions. Miles Allen led a, a paper developing this uh, idea of GWP star, which is actually, instead of a single, equa a single number, it's a small equation. And it actually does a really good job of comparing the temperature effects of a step change in a short-lived gas, so that is, you know, a, um, a kilogram per year, each year, of methane versus one kilogram or n kilograms ever of, of CO2. And you get quite a different outcome. But what it does do, if you use this, is you shadow, you, you get the same effects more or less of a time series of gases, you get the same effects on temperature as the world would give or as any climate model would give. Whereas this isn't true of that. So just to explain time integrated radio forcing, uh, this really hasn't worked out on this uh, slide. Um, this is methane. And that's its radiative force. Uh, that's its yeah radiative forcing over time, um, blown up by 50 because this all needed to go on a plot. This is from an IP an old IPC thing, IPCC paper. This is um, CO2, and you can see that this one has much higher, sharper radiative forcing in the near term because it's very effective at trapping greenhouse gases while it's in the phase of being methane. It's just that it decays over about 10 years. CO2 has a weaker effect per kilogram, but much more persistent. And then the temperature effects of the two, that's methane, that's CO2. Uh, and GWP is comparing the area under the radiative forcing curves out to 100 years. So it's comparing the per, pin, uh, pink curve with the gold curve, or whatever, orange curve. Uh, and the numbers aren't, these, are, these have both been scaled, which is why uh, if you did it unscaled, this would be 28 times bigger than that. And GTP is looking at the temperature effects after 100 years. So those were the state of the art. But I think GWP star is a more promising way to do stuff that has anything to do with a time series of gases. So warming effects of pulse emissions. This is a um, slide from Andy Reisinger. Um, this pulse emission of methane, that's the um, methane concentration. See how they drop away to zero as that stuff oxidizes? Yep. And then the temperature effects do that. They peak early, high and early, and then they decay away. Uh, for CO2, that's a pulse emission of CO2. There's that familiar steep early decline and then kind of flatlining, which we saw that because it's only the first couple of boxes in the carbon cycle that are scrubbing it out over those first few hundred years. And then the temperature effects are much more like a block. So this is basically like a triangle and this is like a block. And what we do when we do sit play the CO2 equivalence game is pretend you can make a triangle out of a bunch, or a, 
yeah, a, a triangle out of a bunch of blocks, but you're not allowed to vary the width of them, right? So you're not allowed to just stack them up, punch them in. You, they, they've all got to be the same length. And this doesn't work. And here's a great real-world example. So the Nord Stream gas pipe leak recently emitted methane to the atmosphere. Now, this I got the inputs for this from Chris Smith, who uh, developed the FEAR model, um, uh, which is a simple climate model, which we used in the IPCC. I used the same model here. That's one year's... I put all, the, all that Nord Stream leak, put all that gas that they estimate having gone into the atmosphere, I put it into the system as methane. That's what the concentrations would look like. I then... T to show what CO2 equivalents would give you, I then put um, the CO2 equivalent emissions to this that the ETS would say is the same, the GWP100 would say is the same, that, um, you know, that people using those currencies and building trading systems on this would say is the same. And the CO2 concentrations, of course, do that. They don't go anywhere near zero, back down to zero. And so the forcing looks like this, and the warming, crucially, looks like that. So CO2 equivalence underestimates the warming out a couple of decades, underestimates the methane-based warming out a couple of decades, but hugely overestimates it ever after. So at the moment, in the climate change regime, we have a lot of people committed to this idea of CO2 equivalent emissions, and don't, you don't need to change anything, this is all fine, but this is the sort of... This is the sort of thing you get at the far end. You get that, that CO2 equivalents cannot capture the actual warming of two time series of gas, of, of, of two different gases uh, over time, if those gases have different lifetimes. OK? So it doesn't work. Um, and this is a paper making a very similar point um, that if you have a CO2 equivalent, so if you, at the moment you have to report your inventories and in, um, you, you have to um, account for your gases in CO2 equivalents, and you can announce your, um, your emissions reductions target in CO2 equivalents. But if, that, if your, CO, if your um, gas portfolio or your, the emissions you're not going to emit, so your mitigation portfolio, uh, well, if, if all that time series of gases was made up of CO2, you'd follow the purple curve in warming, if it was all made up of um, methane, you'd follow the gold one. And the basic point here is, unless you tell us what the gas mix is, we can't tell, as, as physical climate science, we can't tell how much warming you're going to create. So you've got all these people saying, we'll be under one and a half degrees, and it turns out that in the current generation of um, commitments under the, uh, at least was this was true a couple of years ago when it was a paper by um, a guy, Denison, and... Forster at Leeds, they showed that um, the ambiguity in the warming arising from existing Paris pledges could be as high as 0.17 degrees. So if we've only got like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 degrees between here and 1.5 degrees, and about 0.17 degrees of that is just uncertainty because of your accounting system, that doesn't sound very good. So now there's a bunch of us, a whole bunch of people put their names on a piece saying what you really should do is report these gases separately, including what you're going to do in the future, so that we can actually figure out where we might land in warming. Which, you know, you, if you ask everyone what the Paris Agreement is about, they will, you know, 90% of people will say it's about stopping warming. It's about stopping climate change. They won't say it's about... Uh, getting to net zero on CO2 equivalent emissions of greenhouse gases. They may be confused and think that's the right answer, but I think they'd be wrong. If you look at what the effect of one year's emissions, um, then it's true that this year's emissions, and time scales out to about 12 years, this year's emissions, methane causes more warming, met, this year's methane emissions will cause more warming on a time scale of 10 years than this year's CO2. But that, as you go further out into the future, that methane warming this year, the, war, the warming from this year's methane declines as the methane decays, and so it turns out really, it really doesn't matter. And you can see that the only, and this, there's other gases here as well, and some of the black carbon, organic carbon, uh, all sorts of goodies, sulphur, um, sulphur dioxide, which is the... Um, uh, 
aerosols, which is a cooler. But the only thing that matters about this year's emissions in 80 years time is CO2. Okay. Um, and and the, the real summary of, of a lot of this material is that the warming from methane follows the emissions from methane. The emissions going up, the warming's going up. It, the, if, the, if you've got methane emissions declining just a little bit, 0.3% per annum, then you have a constant level of methane, constant, constant, uh, constant level of warming from methane. And if methane emissions drop all the way to zero, then warming from methane would drop to, to zero over time. That is totally different from CO2, where it's the area under the emissions curve that drives the warming. So for increasing CO2 emissions, the warming's accelerating. Where um, you have constant CO2 emissions, you have a linearly increasing warming. And where you have falling emissions, you're adding declining marginal quantities to the warming. But you're not undoing the warming. And so this is why, when we were back in Kyoto, you know, we're talking about the 90s and so on, emissions were rising from everything. And this difference, the, the difference that short-lived and long-lived gases uh, made to the climate system probably mattered less. But as we step into a phase where people think they're reducing emissions, it's really important to understand what those emissions reductions will do to the climate. OK, so this is a plot. Uh, it's more complex than it needed to be, and there were all sorts of little things I could have got grumpy about. But this is from our IPCC chapter. This is from Chapter 7, which is on the Earth's energy budget, um, the climate sensitivity. Um, and we had the section on um, emissions metrics as well. Uh, figure 7.22. Um, and what it, the, the world here is in black. The um, tem actual temperatures are in black. Um, GTP 100 would give you, in a cumulative framework, would give you that emissions curve. So that's uh, that warming curve for this scenario. This is um, mid-range scenario and an aggressive mitigation scenario. Uh, but you, you can look at either of them. That doesn't make a huge difference. GTP 100, the one about looking at what happens after 100 years, would, get, would undershoot the value of methane, the importance of methane on the climate. GWP20 and GWP100, which are different ways of comparing time integrated radio forcing, uh, cannot capture the fact that when methane emissions fall, temperatures fall. Okay, so they just miss that point. They, they can't pick that up. So they're a lousy metric in a time of a climate mitigation. Um, and G, uh, GTP, uh, G, sorry, GWP star is the green line. So it very closely matches what the world would do, or world did do. So we're, um, we're arguing you should use the one that accurately reflects the warming, the metric that accurately reflects the warming, rather than something you brewed up in the 1990s when you'd been thinking about ozone. Okay. Right, and if you use customary CO2 equivalents to trade off gases, um, and this is my fear for the United States. Um, so there are a bunch of places in the world, um, in the fairly well-developed world, southern South America, Ireland, New Zealand, even Australia, but where methane, a lot of methane comes from um, agriculture, um, as well as, of course, Asia's rice fields. Um, but in, the, in most of the global north, in most of Europe and North America, it's, methane is from fossil sources. And there, you can make... Um, reductions in methane emissions by just fixing leaky pipes and things like that. And that stuff saves you money because you can use the gas rather than have it escape. So the fear here is that they're going to use something like this wildly ludicrous GWP20, which people like Robert Howarth in America are arguing for in um, New York. And it's a terrible idea because what it does is it... Um, that lets you trade off 84 units of CO2 for one unit of methane. So you fix your pipe, you fix your pipe, you save one kilogram of methane from going into the atmosphere. You can now say, if you have a trading system like this, that I'm going to emit um, 84 units of carbon driving around New York, and I'm carbon neutral. And that's insane. Uh, and that leads to a much warmer world in the long run. They didn't actually put it on here, but um, 
If you trade off at GWP 100, then the crossover points at 40, where if you, if you don't emit that kilogram of methane from sheep and you emit 28 kilograms of CO2 instead from fossil sources, for the first few decades, um, that is actually the world is cooler than it would be if you had emitted that kilogram of methane instead. But beyond 40 years, for even more, you're lead, leaving behind a warmer world. And this effect is amplified if you go to GWP20, where you'd lead, leave a much, much warmer world behind on timescales longer than 20 years if you let people build a trading system based on traditional CO2 equivalents that doesn't take account of the physics I'm talking about here. And that's why that's one of the great reasons why we are world leaders in having a split gas target. Other countries will catch up. So you plug your leak, this is the trading point, you plug your leaky gas pipe at negative cost, saving one tonne of methane, you emit 30 tonnes of methane, call yourself CO2, you call yourself carbon neutral, uh, and then the world is warmer than it would have been on time, on time scales while your kids are alive. Uh, that's not very satisfying environmentally. Um, and I find it bizarre that people like Greenpeace seem to think that you should be in the ETS doing exactly that. Right? That has as much credibility as their perspective on GMOs and nuclear power. OK, so the logic of net zero, of stopping emitting, works for stock gases. It's not obviously applicable to flow gases. GWP star reflects the warming, and GWP 100 doesn't. Policy isn't determined, though, by metrics. It's informed by metrics. But things like targets uh, and prices and all those other aspects of policy, they are doing the work. Metrics can either take you off into the weeds and lead to bad outcomes, as we just saw, or they can assist you achieve your goals if they're well aligned. But the metric itself doesn't tell you what the target ought to be. A metric should be determined by the policy goals and then choose your, choose your target intelligently on that basis. So my target for New Zealand would be, we're going to stop contributing to warming by mid-century or thereabouts, or 2060 or whatever. Be realistic. Don't do it all in trees overseas and uncreated markets uh, in places where we really don't know what the rules will be. Um, do stuff at home to get us on a journey of decarbonisation. Um, and don't do it at the expense of a, a, a massive, you know, don't do it at the expense of impoverishing society. Be part of a global transition. And I have the same approach to methane, that you can do stuff on methane. It doesn't need to go to zero. And that's the win we have had using this science. That, um, that we, you know, we have a split target uniquely because of this work. We can do more we, and we can do better. Um, and a lot of it is actually, a lot of it, I'm quite happy to, yep, the, a lot of it I think is actually getting the civil service to catch up with where a lot of people in the farming community already are. Whoops. Well, so choice of policy goals is not purely scientific. It's a function of social choices and priorities, metrics for comparing effects, trade-offs at various levels. Uh, from 19, from 1850, I got a time series of ruminant of, of methane emissions. This was also from Andy Reisinger. Um, I ran it through the fear model. Oh, I kept emissions constant after, um, after 2017 or something when the data series ended. There's a little bit more warming in the pipe from that. Um, I then gave GWP star a go. I gave the other two metrics a go. And as you can see, it shadows the warming for New Zealand. There's a myth out there that um, that uh, you can't use GWP star except at the global level. This is this is this shows you can. Um, it also shows that we have that, that our, our ruminants have caused warming. Um, what's that? Tens? What did we decide? It was about one and a half thousand. Five thousandths. There you go. There you go. That's the number. One point five thousandths of a degree. Thousandths of a degree over. Over one hundred and fifty years. But. The thing is that that warming, that warming, you're replenishing it. Remember, it would go away if you stopped emitting methane, but that's that's the scale of it. Right. Okay. And if we uh, keep emissions constant, we get that. If we um, reduce emissions in line with the Zero Carbon Act, you actually undo some of the previous warming from CO2, uh, from methane, while you're still adding to warming from CO2. So 
as long as you're above zero warm, um, emissions on CO2, you're adding to warming. Remember that orange curve that bent slowly round as you get down to the zero? So under this scenario, rural New Zealand would be reducing the warming they've been, that, that it's responsible for, while urban New Zealand is still adding to its warming. Now, there's a conversation we didn't have because the targets came out of a, an IPCC assessment rather unprocessed and in a rather unsophisticated way, I think, about what fair shares are but in that allocation about who's responsible for climate mitigation. And this is where I would fold this into the conversation about targets of methane, but not about the principle of paying for your pollution. Uh, and the more recently you start, GWP star, the, the lower the baseline. So in 1850, you, you know, if you start in 1850, you count all the warming. Um, if I only count CO2-based warming since 2010, I'll get the same effect, that I'll have a very low number and I'll just be looking at the recent stuff. If I start counting uh, methane-induced warming only from 1990, then I'll say, oh, look, we're, we're already not responsible for much warming. Why do anything? But that's not a full treatment because, of course, because of the nature of methane warming, you're kind of up here, you're sustaining that warming by continuing to emit. That warming would go away if you didn't. Uh, there's a very open question there about how this is ethically different or, you know, in terms of responsibility. It, um, uh, in terms of actual responsibility, a closed power station, which has raised temperatures but is not doing so, is in some senses equivalent to a herd of fixed size that has elevated temperatures but is no longer doing so, especially if they're getting some efficiency gains and coming down slightly. Now, that's not the full story, I don't think, but it's a relevant consideration in how you put your policy together. But, but I would caution against using GWP staff from 1990 or recent, like 2000, and saying we're not responsible for any warming at all, because that isn't true, and that can be shown to be false, and that won't work for you in the, in the policy conversation. There are people waiting out there with talking points against these sorts of claims. <clears throat> So a full accounting, and this is, this is the analogy I've used with Andrew before, a full accounting requires the relevant time series. So this is warming, say from methane, like our John Lynch picture went up, flat, down, right? This is like one of those. I sketched this on the plane as well. 1850, 1950, 2000 over time. If I want to know how much total warming I'm, I'm responsible for today, it's out here. But if I only start counting in 1990, then I can sort of tell myself, well, since 1990, I'm only responsible for this much warming. But of course, that, that comes because I'm neglecting all this. And as I say, there are people like, you know, there are people who are waiting for you to say that so that they can come back and say, but that's not, that's not true. You're responsible for more warming than that. What happens if you go back another 200 years, 500 years? Well, it, it, it would. Um, it, I think in New Zealand's case, well, there were no ruminants here, but wetlands would be a really interesting story to look at. And I think actually, as a research program, I, I'd find that pretty interesting because I don't, I don't know anyone's done a full analysis of wetlands in New Zealand's warming year. Yes, David, I was at my senior job in the tourism year ago and we shot the Dr. Henry Clark from the Climate Change Commission. I asked him that. Yeah. 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 I. I well, he, th this is th this is um, from ruminant agriculture. So this would be ruminant sources. If you were to add wetlands, you would be starting up here somewhere from all those ones, and wetlands would also uh, probably come down because you've drained them, and so then you know, don't have these anoxic environments anymore. Um, so that's a New Zealand graph. Yeah, yeah. This is just an illustrative graph because the point I want people to realise is how unpersuasive saying, if you count from here, I haven't done much is. Okay, so here's a story, right? So you start, you go to the Invercargill show day. Well, you don't because you're all responsible people, okay? But imagine you started drinking somewhere, preferably at home, at 12 p.m. or wherever at 12 p.m. And you got through to 6 p.m. and you sort of, you, and this was the alcohol level in your body. 
So you've been drinking up to about six, maybe at six o'clock closing time, maybe back in those days, and you're no longer drinking. Uh, and then, of course, you go to bed and the alcohol, you know, breaks down. Um, the law is interested in um, the level of intoxication. And if you turned up and said, well, you know, since 5.30 I've only had one beer, o officer, how do you think that would play out? Like, I, I don't recommend that strategy. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, but I don't recommend that strategy. So you've got to be aware of how your accounting is mapping with your regulatory targets. Um, and actually, you need a proper accounting system that takes a, a full account of things, OK? And that's where I'd be careful of voices. Some voices in the community have been trying to say, but, but we're carbon neutral since then. Now, it's relevant that you're no longer adding to warming. I think it's relevant. But it doesn't say you should, that doesn't immediately imply you shouldn't have any target, because, because maybe the regulator decides you should be down here. OK? Uh, cup couple more slides on sectors and gases. Within the ag sector, the dull grey line that I've chosen really badly for the projector is the overall emissions. So you can see that um, the reason it's still warming in the pipe is actually because you've basically been up near current levels of, C of methane emissions uh, since about 1970, 80, 90, sort of for several decades. Um, Beyond 2017, I've just flatlined it just to, for illustration. But um, within the sector, though, the sources have changed from predominantly sheep and beef in the purple to a marginal uh, majority being from dairy in the gold. OK, so this is data from dairy and Z and beef and lamb. Right? I didn't just cook this up. Um, what that means for concentrations is that they're pretty much neck and neck because the concentrations are not just last year's emissions, they're integrating over the last 10 years emissions. Radiative forcing follows a concentration and the warming, because there is some because there is some inertia to the level of warming, the purple line hasn't yet crossed over the um, gold line. A, um, a plot I've meant to get to but I, I haven't got round to yet is this, uh, if I continue that, projected that trend down, which sheep and beef farmers sh shouldn't necessarily welcome, um, then at what point would the warming cross over? And we could, we could perform that experiment. But the basic point here is that sheep and beef farmers have reduced their warming on peak levels by quite a lot, um, but they're still responsible for, for quite a chunk of warming. The, as a subsector, they're responsible for a little bit more, but roughly the same as the dairy guys. Um, and they're both still responsible for positive warming. So if you think you should pay for your warming, which is what I think, then, then that would justify a price. I think you should pay for your warming in the context of what other people are doing as well. And that's where, why I think international, the review of what we're doing in light of action elsewhere is a really important part of what I would want in Hei Wakiki Noa. So can you just give me a factory analogy? Yeah, so imagine you had a factory that was, imagine these were two factories discharging biodegradable pollutant, like biodegradable um, detergent into a river. And these guys were, um, were the bigger factory, and now these guys have caught up. You wouldn't, in that pollution environment where, so if you're the regulator and you come along, like we, want, we want a little bit of a change at the margins in terms of what you're, how much you're polluting. We think, we think that level of biodegradable detergent is too high, and we want it to come down by 20%, 20 let's say. Then you wouldn't say you would price the detergent. You could do a cap and trade system, or you could price the volume, and really it's a question there about the effectiveness of each strategy and the relative prices, how well you know them, and the behavioural response, and a bunch of things like that. But economically, you could get equivalent outcomes. What you wouldn't say is, we're going to not charge you because you've already decreased yours. That isn't the way that would go with two factories polluting a river like this, right? You would charge them in line with their effects on the river. OK? This is the way gases are tradable, and I think this is where the social conversation needs to go. These two scenarios both give about one and a half degrees of warming. I just sort of made them up arbitrarily. But um, there to show that's a rough halving of um, methane emissions. 
So the blue in the in the red curve, um, you burn, you reduce, you go hard after CO two, and you reduce CO two emissions really fast. In the blue curve, you keep the CO, you don't do as much on CO two, but you go after methane. So in the red curve, you don't touch, you just leave methane flat. And in the blue curve, you go hard after methane while also going after CO2, making that go down to zero. But the point is, here there's more burden on the agricultural sector, here there's more burden on the CO2 economy. Now, the Mother Nature doesn't really mind between those two choices. But people will care a lot. And that's why I think what we need to be doing is talking about a conversation between this area under the CO2 curve and the, the level at which we think we're going to stop uh, you know, which we the level of emissions for methane that we're going to stop at, and we think that's fine, that that's our share. That is a well posed conversation in terms of equal climate outcomes, and this is where people, the people who drive SUVs to park outside schools in Christchurch, like somebody the other day, and leave the engine idling for half an hour, while telling you guys you got to cut production. So in some cases, some people say all the way to zero. You know that doesn't seem very fair to me. Uh, equally saying, I don't need to do anything, I, you know, we're, we're good, we're flat, that may not convince people who say, well, then we've got to come down at this rate and what will that do to urban poverty? The point here is there are live conversations you should be having. This is where the political conversation in New Zealand should be. It shouldn't be pretending that anyone who questions kind of the current settings is, um, is out of bounds. So I think that, that more questioning in that area would actually be really beneficial for buying, for getting people to feel they're getting fair outcomes, which I, I don't think um, people necessarily feel right now. So I have a GWP star hmm. that I understand can't be used on an on-farm level for accounting, but let me finish. Hmm. Um, I think you need, it needs to be a whole lot simpler this is pretty complicated stuff. The IPCC says that it overestimates GWP yep. 100 overestimates by three to four times. I think you people could consider a simple number for a GWP star or double star or what you like, which might be five, six or seven. Yeah. I'm and what is it? If you do that, you can use it at a farm level. And Bob Durante, you've got rid of that would be that would be the G so GTP basically does pretty much exactly that where it's one number finding the exchange rate according to temperature in a hundred years time so it's a simplification and at that point a hundred years out the two would give convergent results I actually think we can do a bit be a bit more sophisticated and take into account that short-lived warming as well as the long-lived warming so my my kind of starter for 10 is that when we think about life cycle analysis, that we think about having, you know, on, on a carbon or a climate label, we would have this product causes this much short-lived warming and this much long-lived warming. And it may be for wool products, for instance, that their number is negative. Um, and I think that that would be an exciting way to take it. And when I say that in Wellington, of course, people say, oh, it's all way too complicated. And then you hold up a jar of Marmite because a jar of Marmite has on its back a recommended daily intake, which is a rate and a quantity in, in grams, which is a number. And so what I'm suggesting is no more complex than a jar of Marmite. So, Jock, so we did look at GWP star at farm level, and yeah, what we yeah. didn't want to do is dumb down New Zealand's agricultural potential. And with that time series, if you, like Hugh Gardine was here earlier, and he's got two boys who just bought a farm and are intensifying it, and effectively, if he was, um, if he had to report in his time rates under GWP star, he would be hugely vulnerable for the increase. We actually want it at a sector level that informs. But I mean, it's a relatively simple number, which is a quarter or a fifth, and you've got rid of most of it. I mean, there are errors all over the place in these theories. Yeah, and you could argue that the cows come home. They have been report, the latest one, for 70 pages of building up the bloody bureaucracy. Point I'm making, kind of cost you a hell of a lot of money. Yeah, the point I'm making, Jock, is, is using the appropriate metric at the appropriate level of the conversation we need to have, because sometimes there's some unintended consequences of asking for a metric at a certain level. We just need to understand that. So... I've just got a question, yeah. uh, it's just on that. It's like, when you look at the 
secular point of view, it's like you talk about the beef and lamb and the and the deer and the reduction, which obviously a reduction, you should actually be looking at that farm level because that's the only way we can actually alter it in the farm. If you look at the extensive and intensive farming, that same that animal is not the same. There's a whole lot of different inputs and cost structures around that animal. So that's where when you look at a farm, which you can and can't do, you've got to come back to like a heap there because otherwise you get them distortions that you're getting now with the current stuff. Well, that's the way the system's been constructed, John. You would look, you, you know the system, A plus B minus C. Yeah, but it's been constructed wrong. Well, it, well it, it, you're reporting on your contribution. It's like the two factories sitting beside a river. That's what, but to be honest, John, that's what we've created with a, you understand what your methane contribution or your nitrous oxide contribution is, and you know what your potential for sequestration or mitigation is. And you can get yourself to a point where you uh, don't have any liability no, with those can't. levers that you pull. No, you can't. A lot of farmers don't realise on their farms, unless they start cutting money in the highest trees, they'll be stopping, that they <coughs> Yeah, no, well, let's have that conversation, John, but I would contest the way you, you, you're playing that out. Jason? I agree with John, and if you take the frames, um, alcohol analysis in a, in a you know, in your human body, two different people are two different species, right? So you've got a 100 kilo guy and a 50 kilo guy, the alcohol content's going to be way different. So, no, what John's talking about with farms. Yep, so and, and that's what we've constructed a system to recognise. So that's why... The intricacies of each person's individual business. <laughs> The cleanest way to do all all the stuff too with gases is this is um, a piece came out earlier in the year, led by Miles. But there's about 45 people on this. Um, it's all it's the vast majority of the people who write actively on the issue of greenhouse gas metrics, arguing that you should indicate separately the contributions of long-lived and short-lived greenhouse gases, and it doesn't. And, and pref, we'd prefer them gas by gas, because then we can figure out any quantity you want from that. So we can then go, well, how much warming has it caused since, you know, since the farm was established? And of course that's one, one of the reasons why people say GWP star is not so great on farm, because if you've just got established, if you just started the farm, you get a big kick, because if, you're, if you start after the date starts, you get all that warming, whereas if you've been going for 50 years, you only get the warming since that uh, you, only, you only have to worry about the warming since the, the date. So indicating the quantities of gases is a really important feature of letting us have a rounded understanding of the gases' um, uh, implications for the climate. And I, I don't really see an objection to that. Whether you price it in a cap-and-trade system so that it's priced coming on whether or not you are above or below a sinking lid, or whether you're priced on the full... Uh, quantity you're emitting, that's a policy design choice and, and, it, and it will, it'll have different implications for people within the system, especially if you make them, if you grandparent the pyramids on the cap and trade system, or if you auction them, or if you have a mixed approach. But the gains for the climate can be the same under any of these. So that's where I'm quite, you know, I don't have a particular horse in that race in terms of uh, whether the pricing is on the, the per kilogram or on, or you had a cap and trade system where it would be deviations around what you've been doing and your target. Um, I think the price per kilogram is simpler, um, but that that ought to be absolutely ought to be a part of the the conversation. The obvious thing to do, and this is a slide. I, these slides, as I say, most of them I gave in America, is to manage short-lived gases separately. 
especially where they're emitted by different processes than long-lived gases, as is the case with the agriculture sector. And there I, I, I kind of agree broadly with what Simon Upton's been talking about with a land sector climate policy and, a, and an urban or a CO2 fossil climate policy. And I think a lot of us have concerns about carbon farming coming in and destroying rural communities and locking carbon up, not necessarily uh, for very long. And the, the real problem there is that you have a... You should be, you know, from a climate perspective around the world, you should be looking to pull through low carbon technologies rather than just plant trees, because that's not a scalable answer. Um, and the problem is that you've got this incentive where what should be a backstop technology to plant what you can't not emit ends up being your policy of first recourse. Uh, and I've been to business meetings from businesses in New Zealand for, for a decade where people will come along and talk about their path to net zero and claim they're already there because they've planted a bunch of trees, even though you know they're emitting lots and lots of fossil carbon. That's not a sustainable version of sustainability. So I think you should manage these separately. I think forestry's role really needs a comprehensive look. Uh, two policy think tanks, the Productivity Commission and the PCE, both landed on the idea of two-basket approaches. I think we won that debate with people who didn't have a strong prior that we should use TWP 100. Uh, and then I mentioned Hewaka Ekinawa. Uh, reflection on New Zealand's journeys, and this is another slide I showed with the people and shared with people in Seattle. I actually think that your sector and the science community understand this fairly well. I don't get in arguments with my fellow climate scientists about the two basket approach. Um, I, I'm disappointed that I don't feel that the public as a whole understand that uh, and that I think that their view of what's gone on has been um, has that I don't think it's the New Zealand media's finest hour in covering climate change um, I think that um, I don't think I think the media have been so scared that to say anything that might mean that somehow the farmer community does less that they haven't reported the degree of consensus that probably does exist among the, the climate research community in this country on, on this point. Um, when policymakers do understand the issue, they tend to land on two basket approaches. The conversations about targets and policy architectures get unhelpfully muddled. So I think an integrated measurement framework and price structure seem possible within a couple of years. You can then have a conversation about what you do with that money. The issue of where methane emissions need to be in 2050 is a separate issue, and that's the one that I think you need to go back to that blue wedge versus where the blue line is compared to the red line. That's the conversation that hasn't happened that would, that would lance the boil of resentment that I see building in provincial New Zealand against urban New Zealand's kind of slightly hectoring tone on, on methane. Uh, I think that's an important conversation to have. And it's different from how you price it and all that sort of stuff. Your price is a servant of taking you to the target. That's what it should be for. We're moving towards a two-basket approach, but a range of our obscurantists may yet steal defeat from the jaws of victory. Um, I think that's possible. I think bad outcomes are always on. Uh, I note that the Treasury, I was very disappointed the Treasury argued for methane going in the ETS. I think the reason I really hate the idea of going in the ETS is this. If you go into the ETS, um, the current, so current price is about $80 a tonne of carbon. You would go in at GWP 100 times that price, which is, what, 28 times 80. And then, you know, David Parker's start of 10 was that you would only pay 5% of that because you're in the export sector. So then, at that point, if you go with that, you've basically handed back that card of environmental integrity and said, OK, we're not going to do it on warming, we're going to do it on emissions, we'll go in with the ETS. We're not worried about warming, which I don't think is the right answer environmentally. If you went in on that basis, you would be paying 5% of your ETS price on your methane. All the people who don't like you will then say, only 5%, surely it should be 10%, 20%, 30%. There is no stopping point short of 100 And the other thing is that price on carbon is going to go up. To get to zero on carbon, you need a, a high and rising price on carbon dioxide. 
It's $80 now. There's no reason to think it won't be twice that in 10 years. And then you'd be paying either 5% of a price that's unnecessarily high, because you're anchored to the carbon price, right? You'd go up with it. Or you'd be saying, well, we should only pay 2.5%. And how do you think that's going to look? How do you think that'll play out? So I think going into the ETS would hand opponents of agriculture, uh, you would hand back the thing that you have, the, the, the strong argument you have to base policy on warming, which is what people care about, and to keep, and to keep emitting because you're still producing. And you are the most efficient farmers in the world in terms of methane. To hand all that back and go in the ETS, you'd be a hostage to fortune, and I don't see why they wouldn't say it should be 100%, and I don't think there'd be much of an industry left at that point. Um, the things I think you should fight about are the... And this was all in my submission to Heiwaki uh, I, I would start with a lower price. The EU ETS, which, you know, we're always told about how wonderful the Europeans are, usually by European expats, but never mind. But they had a low price to start with, and they grandparented all the permits because they were in the first phase of learning about this. Now, asking you guys to go in and start playing with real ammo, I don't, I don't see the justification for that. I think that you should go in and learn with, a, with not a peppercorn price, a price to see a behavioural response, but not a price that rural communities would find crippling. So I, I think that you, you should argue on price. I think sequestration is a really important part of it. I think it's a really important feature to get right as one of the levers that you have in terms of um, uh, managing to um, offset your warming. So I helped um, with some of the science behind a report Simon Upton has just released, which is it's, we're using Pinus because it grows fast and because we know the numbers, but I, I'm not a huge Pinus fan. But what it suggested was that you could mimic the, um, the warming effect of removing a sheep from a um, herd uh, by planting 0 0.08 hectares of pine. And that would be permanent. So you could keep that herd, plant that pine, and it would be as if you had permanently removed that sheep. For beef, it's 0.4 hectares. For dairy, it's 0.6 hectares. Those are large numbers, but it's because you're mimicking, you're, you're having the permanent effect of the warming um, of that stand and the, perma uh, the same uh, offset against the permanent additional removal of the, of the ruminant. That's why, the, that's why it's so geared. But using something like that uh, could be a way of finding um, a way to meet the kind of uh, targets that you may end up facing. And I would do it on the basis of warming. And because the concern is with sheep and beef communities, I think everybody from the Prime Minister on through has accepted that, that that is a concern with this set of policies. Why not start with that warming-based sec on-farm sequestration for sheep and beef farmers only, so that the dairy guys can't access that, and you can you can get in there and do that and develop it, and see if that works, and see if it doesn't work, and then we can go back to the drawing board and have another go. Yeah. So, Dave, you touched on the soils where yeah. specialisation. Um, yeah, um, 7%, 6 to 7% on our farm of carbon yep. in the soil, growing 2 millimetres of topsoil a year and 4 going in, in play getting turned to soil. That's 60 tonne of soil we're growing a year and 7% that is 4.2 uh, tonne carbon per hectare. So... So I don't, have a, I don't have a full understanding of exactly what you would need. It, I can think of several different ways you could approach soil carbon, but the one that would mimic the geological reservoir is the stuff that's kind of permanently retired from the, from the ecosystem, rather than stuff that's actively in the biosphere. I don't know... It, it would be really interesting to look at, because, um, because it actually... Well, yeah. Well, I've become carbon neutral, so... So, I mean, I'm emitting under big demand, I'm emitting 4.5 tonne to the hectare of, of CO2. I'm not talking methane, I'm talking CO2. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so I'm just farming normally, just a normal standard sheep and beef farm. I've done all the testing on it, and I'm carbon neutral. So, you wouldn't need any of all this other rubbish if you actually... We've spent 
three or four hundred million or whatever we've spent so, um, in yeah. 18 years. And we've actually come up with the bugger all. Well, I don't know about that, but I... Um, in terms of soil carbon, the thing that you'd want is additionality and to be able to monitor how much carbon was permanently sequestered. That's it's the permanence of the sequestration that you care about. And you'd want to know the rate, and then we could fold it into something like that. Okay, I'm just going to finish off on these points. The 2030 and 2050 targets were uh, came quite arbitrarily out of the SR 1.5 report where they said that the range of integrated assessment models um, suggested that Cutting methane by 24 to 47 percent were the only models that um, were consistent with one and a half degrees. Now, I think that's a really lousy piece of reasoning to go into target formation. Um, people hide behind the IPCC said it, but the integrated assessment models. One, we're not going to stay under one and a half degrees. So, um, the and that's not good news, right? But it is news. We. Um, the emissions reduction rates of carbon dioxide that we need to stay under one and a half degrees are about 8% per annum globally. The world champs of emissions reductions of CO2 over a sustained period, probably the UK, who I think between 2007 and 2020 reduced emissions by something like 2.3% per annum. So you're asking the world as a whole to do something where a rich country at the front of the pack only managed a third of it. So I don't think that's going to happen. So why we're then setting our methane targets on the basis of a policy, uh, on the basis of a set of scenarios that are inconsistent with what's actually going to happen, I don't know. <laughs> so, right, so, that, so, this, so targets are something that I think you, that there, there is a really legitimate conversation to be had there about what the right targets are. Uh, and I would link that to this point about review, that I, I would start with a price like this to learn about the system. You've got multiple levers in the system, as you know. Um, you've got sequestration, you've got the price, you've got whatever you do with nitrous, for instance, and you've got the ETS carbon forestry price lurking in the background as well. So you've got several levers. How they interact with the price is something you're going to have to learn about. I would review the whole lot quite rapidly, within th two, three years, three, three years maybe, to try and figure out what that domestic behavioural response is to get a handle on how sensitive the system is. But also on, I'd make some clear um, commitments to, to uh, you know, only cranking up the targets if other countries were visibly playing. So nobody expected the EU ETS to be the only ETS there was. And they certainly didn't start cranking up the price until there were other players in that space. Um, it doesn't mean everybody has to be playing, but you have to have some company, or else it, it or else it's kind of it really is then the kind of um, a hostage to fortune. So those are the things for those reasons that I'd be looking to put pressure on the government on. I wouldn't be pushing against the basic idea that you should pay for the warming you cause. I don't think you don't think you're going to win that. Um, the two basket approach in principle is the right approach, and I think you going, jumping back to sticking it all in the ETS um, and taking your chances, like you know it doesn't work. You know that the that it's going to give you the ambiguous or wrong signed warming that you could easily end up with a warmer world because of that move. That's just poor form. So don't don't fight the two basket thing. Don't fight the basic idea of paying for for the warming. The cap and trade versus the levy, I get why some people want to fight over that, but but I actually, I, I think that you could let the perfect be the enemy of the good there. Um, so those are my, those are my main points. So now I think we've got about half an hour of Dave. questions. Yeah. Um, Dave, Dean Carson. Oh, good day. Hi. Yeah, yeah. Ben, um, yeah, really enjoy yourself. Thanks. Uh, but do, I've actually got many, many the the idea of the legacy war, um, and you know, if we can go back to that graph where you shift the time scale, um, I actually think we should be having that conversation. Yeah, that one. That one. Yeah, correct. Right. And the idea that over recent times we could argue that we've actually cooled. Yep. But there's a legacy, legacy warmth that we've still got to deal with. 
Right. And, and that legacy wolf is prominent in the populations that we build up. Now, the reason why I think we should have that argument is because we don't talk about the steam engine mm. that burnt the coal and the, and the liability associated with that. We don't talk about the 1950s grey fergie and the emissions from that grey fergie. And so if we're going to have, I think, a conversation around equivalencing pressures on industries and fairness and equity, I think we should still have a conversation around recent cooling. Um, uh, cooling is a word that's yep. scary for yeah. people, um, and I've had some recent debates around this stuff. But in my view, it's a real thing. So I, I've tried for three or four years to get, I, I did a philosophy degree as well in my physics, to get ethicists interested in this point because I actually think that you know, it is an interesting point about how you think about um, warming that one person's sustaining when someone else has caused a bunch in the past and what you think about responsibility. I haven't managed to get anyone on board, and I don't, I don't know why. I'll give it another go when <laughs> next in the UK. But the, um, I think it's an important point ethically that nobody's thought through properly, and I think the, the couple of papers that are out there are quite poor on this. Um, I wouldn't let it get in the way of being part of pricing your emissions. I do think it should inform mitigation burden shares. So that's where I'd start out with a low price and learn and then have that conversation and let that inform your targets, which inform your subsequent price. There's also the fairness question. There's a bunch of fairness questions. There's horizontal ones like... If Ireland aren't pricing theirs and Uruguay aren't pricing theirs and Brazil and America aren't, why are we? Uh, that is a horizontal equity question. The time one is, is interesting as well. And um, uh, the arguments I've heard for, oh, but that's in the past so we forget about it, that's not the attitude we take in other fields. So if you committed a murder last week, we wouldn't say, oh, you're good, it was last week, don't worry. We'll be worried about you, you know, bumping into someone tomorrow, though, because that's in the future. That's not... We don't do that. So my, my response to those people has been: let's deal with warming first, and then let's deal with warming as a secondary outcome, yeah. which is a legacy warm thing. And the reason why I argue that is, again, we're not taking responsibility for the steam engine and the very tractor and all that stuff. Yep, I understand all those arguments. I, I actually occasionally have this conversation with Miles because he's, I think, a little closer to your position. I, I guess I. Um, I see that as, if you had a good political conversation about all of this, that would be factored in, and that's how we sort out values disagreements. But I do think, I, I accept the basic point that um, if it's warming you care about, then the fact that somebody did a whole bunch yesterday is also important. And if we're not pricing that, why are we pricing the fact, you know, you today? But, but you are responsible for warming, and if we think people should pay for warming, that's really a bill we haven't levied on previous generations. But we might, because actually the big thing out of the new COP is loss and damage, which presumably would follow that steam engine. Yeah, we get, we've got some weird things going on now, eh? So we're, we're reporting negative, negative results from the recent ag research, right? From, from, oh, yeah. From the LCA stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah th I, and, and we're calling it sort of a no effect on... The re cooling. I think... We're getting some weird results because we're scared of this cooling. Uh, I'm not scared of cooling. I mean, I actually have a slide I use in, only in Wellington. Well, I don't think you are, but yeah. from a policy point of view. So they say that undoing previous warming is not the same as cooling, but actually in every dictionary, cooling means a negative temperature trend. So if the sun goes behind the... If, the, if a cloud comes in front of the sun, people say it's cooled off. They don't say, ah... Oh, I am now receiving less radiation from the sun, even though... Um, I think it's a practical reason for not... So GWP star, or warming, at small scales in noisy time series will bounce around all over the place. And basically the point is that trend is near zero. And if you claimed it negative this time, if it just happened to be up next time, it's going to leap around all over. I think there's a... It's a sound practical reason, but it, that, all that stuff needs more work, and Andre and Stu would be the first people to say that, I think. I've had that debate with Andre. <laughs> David, can you just go to the current sector contribution slide? Because this goes to that point, Dean, um, 
what is our current is it this way? Sec Wrong way. sector contribution to warming, but it also feeds into the importance uh -huh. of the value of sequestration in that LCA report and getting recognised for sequestration. And that's like a, almost a non-negotiable? Yeah, it's in my submission. Good. <laughs> Emma? Right. Um, so I apologise if I've got this wrong, so fresh water is more my topic than climate change. Um, but you did touch on the, the, um, the point about equity. Mm. Um, I was thinking about the levy and the, um, the fact that that's going to be invested in new technologies. Um, is it true to assume that those new technologies are likely to benefit or more suit um, industries that have sort of daily contact with stock rather than um, stock that are sort of... Well, I don't know. I, that's just... I, I'm sorry, I don't... You might know that, I don't. Yeah, no, look, that's a belief, Emma. Like, the first technology we'll, we will get out of the traps is sheep genetics. So it will benefit the sheep sector first. I was a wee bit instrumental in that. I sat on PGGRC and I kept referring to this, look, this isn't about industry, this is about sheep are lab rats. So let's do the technology there, but then we can demonstrate it and we'll get it out of the blocks first. Because you, you, you wouldn't want to end up in a situation where you've got um, deer farmers or sheep and beef farmers subsidising dairy, for example. Correct, yeah. And all the inhibitor work we've done on is we've worked out delivery mechanisms for inhibitors. First cab off the rank will be in shed feeding. But the work we're doing is around bolus delivery of inhibitors that can be used in any ruminant. Um, I've got two questions. Uh, the first one is you haven't talked much about nitrous oxide. Mm. What, uh, what role does that have in all of this? And the other thing is, uh, you may not be an expert in this area, but you might have a view. What uh, threat do you think um, fermented meats and plant-based meats might mm. have um, in this situation? Um, nitrous, nitrous decays basically uh, sort of an in intermediate way between methane and CO2. It's, it, it's got a, it, you can characterise it by a single, single decay timescale of 120 years. Whether that's long or short, funnily enough, is the sort of thing Oxford professors argue about. So um, some of our team who do planetary science think that's really you know, quite short, but for those of us doing climate research, we think that's quite long. You could you could put it in a land sector policy. You could stick it in the ETS. Like, I think you should do whatever's practical, but I don't think it throws up all the issues that methane throws up, which is why we're having this conversation with methane. The plant-based stuff is really interesting because that's where I think it's important that the sheep and beef sectors lead with the carbon labelling or climate labelling. If you don't do it, Friendlies aren't going to do it, um, and if you don't do it, the, the people emitting ton, quite a lot of carbon, remember they got up to 28 times that they could go for before your kilo of methane. So they'll, they'll come after on the basis of climate friendliness, and getting a system in place that properly reflects warming would be a good thing. Um, I meet a lot of people in, in my narrow university world who are big on the plant-based stuff, um, but I, at this point, I think it's pretty niche globally. Yeah, M Morris, 80% of the profile on most of our farms will be methane. About 16% of the profile is nitrous oxide, but it's still a really important gas in relation to that. Pricing, it's about 290 times if you did it at, at ETS price. So if in the submissions, if you link that to ETS price with that assumption you're going to get free allocation, it's a really dangerous place to go really dangerous place to go. By the same token, we need to take it seriously. Second, that, that alternative proteins, like we did that report at Beef and Lamb 2018, every protein has a footprint. Mm. So it goes to David's point around, you know, get the metrics right, get the reporting right, that you validate the footprint of your protein and do an accurate comparison. This is actually a question for uh, Emma. Yep. What is uh, Beef and Lamb's positioning if the government refused to revise the targets? Oh, it's pretty much the same as the Fed's position, Jason. I know you're trying to set me up here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, what I need to stress, guys, is this, this, is a, this is a really difficult subject. Now, so I'm really pleased that you guys are here having this conversation because it's to, it's to David's point. I think our farming community really understands this stuff and understands the implications, and that's why the 11 sector organisations got together and went with a united position. 
So the point being is, yeah, like there's a whole bunch of things that are actually really, really important to make this work for us, and that's what we wanted to convey to you. If the government, you know, simply saying we want the sector target reviewed, is it's, it was going to happen anyway in 2024, a year before you start writing your first cheque out in 2024. I, I think you have a huge accepted. opportunity to lead here globally, um, actually, and I think that the that um, that it it's a great. Yeah, and it will come at a cost. But I think that change is coming. Agricultural climate policy will be coming in one form or another. Um, the National Party have indicated that. The Labour Party have um, shown it. Um, I think it's going to be coming in other jurisdictions too. And you can either help shape it by being a leader, or you might end up like the Irish, where they'll probably go into the ETS. Uh, and they get these big structural funds from the EU and what have you that... that you know, that what the EU giveth, the EU can taketh away, and they they um, have a buffer because of that that you don't have. Ian? No, no. so not working. Yeah, that's it. Before your eyes go, <laughs> the, the question you've touched on it is, and using forestry as offset, and, and I didn't get the figures exactly right on your cheap meat farm, but I want to step back a step on that and ask the question, can we not stop the overseas buyers buying land in New Zealand and setting the carbon credits overseas? Yeah, so look, good question Ian, because let's, there's two conversations we're having here. One is Haywaka Kanoa and the industry pricing. The other one is the Climate Change Response Act, which has enabled that 100% of carbon offsetting, so it sits separate to this it still has the same impact on our rural communities. So yes, be well assured there was a submission on that went in last Thursday on the 18th. That is actually the biggest risk to our farming communities as opposed to this. Yes, so what you're saying is that the European price for carbon is twice the price in New Zealand, so it makes it very easy for them to buy well, land in New Zealand. Well, not necessarily. The report that Beef and Lamb's just done, you know, 54,000 hectares has gone into carbon forestry this year. I can't remember the percentage, but the, the large percentage was not overseas buyers. It was actually uh, New Zealanders. And so, like, the overseas access to New Zealand farmland is, is a slightly red herring. It's the policy setting that even if you shut that, New Zealanders will still offset their carbon. We need to shut that down. Yes, yeah, so question, Andrew, actually, um, you Last week or the week after was uh, carbon neutral farmers, the beef and land farmers were carbon neutral, I think was a report came out. Uh, when did that report get published and why did it take so long to come out? Yeah, yeah well, um, that, was, uh, um, that was the life cycle analysis work that um, was done at AgriSearch and um, it came out a couple of weeks ago because like that's when the journal published it, basically, that you don't see it. You, you submit papers, they get reviewed, that can take a variable length of time, gets published in the journal. That's what's setting the time scale there. There's nothing domestic involved in that, I wouldn't have thought. Um, carbon neutral is not a phrase I think they use. They, we talked about, we've talked with the community about climate neutral, which can mean no longer perturbing the climate up or down, like no longer pushing the temperatures up or down um, because carbon neutral means you need, need a measure for carbon which is sort of one of the points was that we don't have a very good one so it was um, there's been a bunch of papers that have shown New Zealand's climate impact of its food and diet are um, not nowhere near as bad as you would get under CO2 equivalents uh, there was one by John O'Barnes that yeah, too. What we wanted to do, Bill, was give our consumers confidence around the products that we're actually, you know, we export 98% of our mutton, 95% of our lamb, 90% of our beef. We want to, when it goes back to that alternative proteins question there from Morris, we want to give our customers confidences of the products that they are buying and the impact on climate. Um, and then there was a whole bunch of uh, intricacy we put in there because we introduced the concept of GWP Star to inform this climate metrics debate also. And, I, and, that, and that conversation's got a long way to, to go yet. I, I don't think we've... I think we've cracked the way to deal with time series of gases with GWP star. I don't think we've cracked it for LCA. 
I think I think we'll get there, but it it you know not not tomorrow, not literally tomorrow. Um, but uh, but I think all this stuff is really important, and I think if you don't put warming at the heart of it, then um, then you might end up with um, some really silly outcomes that that actually don't do anybody any good because they leave to a warmer world in the long run. David, going back to one of your earlier slides on the sunlight radiation coming from the sun. Oh yep. Yeah. Um, if we're going to have a, globally, we're going to plant more and more trees, which are quite dark, and they're going to absorb all this yeah. all this sun energy. Are we going to see a hell of a blip in 30 years' time when all these trees are? either falling down, being used for biofuels or whatever? It's just a yeah, um, if you stagger the tree planting, so on a small area, yes, you can end up with these sawtooth shapes in the carbon stock. Uh, if you, um, you know, plan appropriately over a range of timescales so that you're planting similar quantities every year and harvesting every year, what you kind of get is a, is a cooling... A, a cooling curve that looks like that, that is smoother than the, saw, than the accumulating sawtooth you get um, if you just uh, plant, if you plant everything and then cut it down at once and then plant everything and then you end up with some sequestration, permanent sequestration, and then you grow it, cut it down and so on like that. So you can smooth that by planting over large enough areas that that smoothing more or less works. Certainly at the global level, I think there are questions, one of the questions is, is about albedo, that if you're planting areas, forests are dark, uh, you're planting something that was um, like a tundra or something that's often covered in ice, then you may end up affecting the Earth's albedo, which is the, that reflectivity, the, this one here, which is just how much light is reflected from the surface of the Earth. So if you, if you plant a ton of trees and take away all the ice, you'll chop that off and you'll add radiation to be absorbed. So you'll, you'll increase surface temperatures that way. It's possible. Sorry? Last couple of years or whatever, most of Australia was on fire. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. So can you give us some idea of what effect those fires in Australia have on this yeah. type of scenario? Yeah. I don't, I don't know the, um, the amount of carbon released off the top of my head, but, um, but they were big, and um, they and California also had massive wildfires. We expect more of that sort of thing. It's another factor that I know uh, Simon Upton at PCE has thought about a lot in the context of the New Zealand ETS, is that if we're walking into higher fire risks as time goes by, and New Zealand's not like California or Australia, but it does have wildfires, as, as you know, um, then you may end up turning your carbon stock that you've created so people can still drive their cars around to, you know, you can may volatilise it into the atmosphere pretty effectively. So th those, those risks are definitely well worth thinking through. I don't think forestry policy takes adequate account of them. <laughs> yep, yep, I agree. Yep. Got a question here, David. Yep, yep. Um, thanks for your presentation. I've got to say, a lot of your graphs were right over my head with the complication. <laughs> you outlined the scientific um, uh, process really well and the change that you think we should make. So, for me, it comes down to a political decision. And when I see the world now um, going back to the year 2013, which I think was the largest coal burning year in in history and with the energy crunch in the Northern Hemisphere, we're going back to the biggest coal burning year this year that we've ever had. Mm. And I see the petro economies, the large petro economies really just pushing towards methane um, for the yeah. quick easy gains and I see the last COP conference that's just wound up, there was over 650 uh, lobbyists from the fossil fuel yep. industry attending. Yep. Um, so I, I don't want to depress everybody, but it's all against us. Any, any comments on that? Um, you know, I, I agree with everything you said. I find it incredibly depressing that to me and to most, most of my friends in this field, this is a fossil carbon problem. 
and that is most of the game right there, and all the rest is is small change by comparison. I think there is a case for you playing your role, but but I also think that you know I, I it crosses my mind that why why is it so hard to get these sort of points turned into policy? And internationally, I think there are bad actors. You know, people. So in the two, in the two basket conversation we had here, um, included in the people who very much opposed to the two basket suggestion. So we treat methane differently. It doesn't have to go to zero. That ref, that um, uh, thing they had in 2018, where they actually asked people to to vote on that. Um, among the submitters very opposed to the two basket approach were Todd Energy. Uh, and most of the oil majors, I think Z as well. Um, why? Because, because... Sorry, there's so many clicks in this thing. Um, the reason the fossil guys don't like people like me is because of this. They want that one, where you go hard at mitigation so they sell more product. And, and I can't quite believe how many people fall for that. We should have a conversation about fair shares within that. But, but I, I, you know, I, it, it's, um, to think that they don't have a role in this is, uh, I think, naive. Now, I've just got a question. Uh, just to follow on sort of a bit about the, the, the farm forestry on the forestry plains, you were sort of zooming these trees are going to be harvested. Yeah. Most of these trees are going to be planted, they're going to be planted in a very short time frame, and most of them will never be harvested and never be pruned. So, because you know, people are just going to plant them for carbon credits, for, for actually financially getting off the hook. So, what does that mean when we've got all this area of pines in 100 years' time? So, I think the talk of forestry is going to be very limited. Farmers are just going to plant because they're forced to plant, and we've got carbon farms now. So, what happens in 100 years when this forest, this pine is what? dying? Yep. Um, plus all the forest and everything else along the way that you mentioned. We did actually look at that in some of the background science for the PCE report, was what happens if you plant pinus and leave it and how much warming is sequestering after 100 years in that case or, or longer. We also looked at some other species and natives, for instance, which have slower growing periods, of course, but potentially are better carbon stores in the long run. We The, the pinus work was used to get on with it and get a report out, um, but we know that there's a lot more to be done in that. You know, this is emerging science, thinking about balancing warming in this way, um, and um, I think we partly learn by doing. But um, but I don't think I don't think pinus should be the answer everywhere. And if we incentivise everything to be pinus, we probably haven't done that very well. Um, but the basic idea of offsetting your warming from forestry is reasonable. But we we've got to work through the details, and it shouldn't be pinus everywhere. 100% agree with you, John, you know, because even, there's actually, I don't think there's, a, there's only the politicians are struggling to work out how they're going to stop it, because even Climate Change Commission has said we should put a transitional limit. Yeah. On, so there's actually nobody saying, no, let's crack on with this and plant all in New Zealand and, and trees. What the politicians are struggling to do is find a way to pull back Pandora back into a box, mm -hmm. because there's billions of dollars invested in that already, and they don't know what they're going to do about it. David, I have to thank you very, very much. You've actually 100% convinced me that climate science is not settled. And how any government can actually formulate policy on the scrambled eggs that we've seen tonight. This bit is definitely... The bits that are settled aren't in policy. Have we, can we agree on that? <laughs> so I, I think a lot of climate science is settled. But, but I think this stuff... I think we've got a lot of science, and like I say, when I talk to climate physicists, they don't they don't argue about this stuff. Um, we have much smaller fish to fry, but the the um, getting it into policy is is hard because of because of inertia. Mm. Right, we'll wrap it up here. Um, look, thanks, guys. Two hours to sit here and actually go through a pretty heavy subject. Look, I just want to thank you all for sitting there for so long. But this is big for our sector, and I and I know there's a lot of uh, concern a lot of um, questioning. So that's why I wanted to get David down here, because we've been having a bunch of woolshed meetings recently, and this, one of the reoccurring themes is, oh, this is all built on shonky science, isn't it? This is all rubbish. Well, we needed to get David here just to give you guys a sense of some of the stuff that informs our views. 
Another sense I want to give you is, you know, that farming leaders group, that's 11 entities, have, you know, have collectively worked on this and they've retabled this proposal back to government now. To go to your point, Jason, um, when, that, when we formed that, we got two ex-Prime Ministers to come speak to us. And the first ex-Prime Minister said, oh, I used to love being Prime Minister because I could drive a bus through you guys, you ag sector, every day of the week. Chicken Growers Federation had come in at 11.15, and the Carrot Growers Federation had come in at 11.30, then Beef and Lamb had come in, come in at quarter to 12, then Dairy and Z would come in, and you'd never get your views aligned, and we could land whatever policy we wanted. He said, the only way you're going to get anything is if you actually align your policy when you come to speak to us and actually know more than government. And that's what we've attempted to do with what we've tabled with this Haywaka. The other thing that the other Prime Minister said is, we're getting really good at yelling at each other, aren't we? And that's what we've seen in our rural sector when we've all got a bit scared and a bit angry over what's going to happen. We've all yelled at each other and we've all told everyone we're wrong and we all haven't given credit for credits due. When David said about uh, the Todd Corporation submitting, 17,000 New Zealand submitted in that Climate Change Response Act and 93% of them submitted against split gas. But we still got it. Because this government does actually want to listen to science when they get boxed into a corner. So um, the second thing, bipartisan support for this haywalker from, you know, from the National Party at the time, and National Party has said we will price emissions if we get in the next election. So let's not use that as a strategy to think we're going to get out of this, because they said we will price emissions and we like the industry scheme. So look, thanks for coming and listening. This is not going away, and we've got to understand it rather than yell at each other, and the best way that we can get a result is to go collectively strong to government with those fundamentals like we listed the other day and with the submission, and pretty much say, look, uh, we can't support anything less is the way we're going to pitch this. Thank you. One, one last story. Oh, okay. This You're is a right. good one. Yeah, so I go two, it's two different groups. The Greeks, the Greek city-states, were, were, they used to bicker among themselves all the time, uh, fight like crazy among themselves. Uh, when the Persians, who were much more numerous and, and militarily advanced, presented a threat, they managed twice to put all that bickering aside and work together and repel the common enemy, right? But it wasn't easy and it wasn't a foregone conclusion. When Hernan Cortes turned up with his 600 conquistadores in Mexico in the, around about 1500, the neighbours of the Aztecs didn't much care for the Aztecs and several of them actually joined with the, the new guy instead of the old one. And the outcome was very different, and history was very different because of it. Working out when to put your differences of opinion with your neighbours aside is a really key strategy to getting good long-term outcomes. Who would you rather be, the Greeks in that case or the, uh, or the, the Aztecs? Just a quick comment. I'm a little bit of a conversion. No, we have a private conversation. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, there's a light supper and tea and coffee up the back, so go and help yourselves. Thank you. Right. Okay. Good work. Right. Good job. Stand around for ten minutes. Answer a few questions.